Okay, today we have uh, Executive Director Jim Nicol from Canada is going to deliver a lecture for us. Mr. Jim Nicol currently serves as the Executive Director of Canadian Trade Office in Taipei, where he is highly engaged in the promotion of economic and cultural exchanges between Canada and Taiwan. He plays a leading diplomatic role in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including Deputy Head of Mission and Embassy of Canada in Beijing, Director General North America at Global Affairs Canada, and Deputy High Commission in New Delhi, India. And Mr. Nico has also undertaken many ventures in Japan and Indonesia when he was appointed as Director of South Asia. He holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Education degree from University of Regina, as well as a Master of Arts from Norway Peterson School of International Affairs at Car Carter University. And he just told me that before here, he has been three years in Beijing, so he can speak a little bit Mandarin. So if necessary, you want to ask a question, uh, you, you are afraid of speaking English, you can speak some Mandarin. Canadian Trade Office in Taipei aims to facilitate reciprocal trade and investment between Canada and Taiwan in addition to forging collaboration in the area of education, culture, science, and technology. Meanwhile, the office launched various activity and provides consular services. So I just talked to the, um, Jim that because NTU has quite a few strategic partners in university in Canada, for example, like uh, uh, British Columbia and also uh, UBC University of British Columbia and also Toronto University, McGill University. They all provide very, you know, very interesting and um, programs, shorter program or exchange program. So if students here want to take advantage of exchange student opportunity to go to Canada or even seek for some degree pursuing opportunity that all are more than welcome to ask uh, Jim or ask me about this opportunity. So, um, before our lecture, that uh, we would like to have a group photo taken, and then, so let's, you know, put on your big smile, and if you want, you can take off your mask. Okay, great. So let's give a big applause to welcome Mr. Jim Nicole to give us a lecture. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Yuan. Uh, and thank you, uh, students, for uh, your attendance uh, today. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I actually don't live very far from your campus. And I've always, uh, I live on the other side of uh, Senlin Gongyan, uh, Dan Sen, uh, Senlin Gongyan. And I always see the white, uh, the white building on this end over here. And I always wonder what's over here. Now I've discovered it's the university. So. <laughs> It's, it's great to be here and uh, wonderful to see everyone today. So uh, today I'll speak a little bit about uh, Canadian foreign policy. As I understand, uh, many of you are students of uh, inter international affairs, international relations, uh, have an interest in that area. So I will speak about Canadian foreign policy. Uh, and in particular, I'll speak about uh, the newly launched uh, Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy. So that was in November of last year that Canada's foreign minister uh, launched this new foreign policy strategy uh, for Canada, uh, for this region, for the Indo-Pacific region. And what I'd like to do as well uh, when I'm talking about that is to focus a little bit more specifically on uh, how this Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy uh, relates to Taiwan and Canada-Taiwan relations. So we'll, we'll talk about that, that more specifically. Before we get started, I thought we better, we better take a look at um, uh, some of the things that, that shape foreign policy. So if, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to speak a little bit about some domestic Canadian things that shape Canadian foreign policy and that will give you an idea of why Canada uh, has taken the foreign policy positions that it has. As you can expect, you know, some of those factors uh, that shape our foreign policy, 
decisions or how a country engages in international relations are things like our geography, our history, our economy, uh, our people and our heritage of our people. So those are factors I'll go over quickly before we right, get right into the, uh, uh, the foreign policy elements of themselves. But to get started, uh, let's just take a look at the map of Canada here. First of all, could I have a show of hands? Uh, how, many, uh, how many people have been to Canada? Not that many. Okay, a few. That's good. I thought there might be more. <laughs> okay, how many people are Canadians? How many Canadians do we have? Uh, we just got one. Okay, good. Okay, so um, the rest of you ha are neither Canadians, nor have you been to Canada. So here's what we're going to do to start things off. I've brought a couple of uh, small uh, gifts uh, from, uh, from Canada that I'd like to give out a little uh, later in the day. But what we'll do is we have to do a quiz. And this is going to be an open book geography quiz about Canada, just to set the baseline here. There's the open book. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and I'll ask you a couple of questions. Just please put up your hand, and I'll get you to the answer. Whoever gets the correct answers wins a prize, and you can collect your prizes at the end of the, end of the lecture. So uh, the first question would be, we'll start with an easy one. We'll start with an easy one to get started. What is the capital of Canada? That's an e this is the easy one. Oh, okay, please, this lady here. Yes. Yes, yeah. Just yell it out. Just yell out the answer. Can I say Chinese? The capital of Canada? Yes, please do. Yes, that's correct. Ottawa. Yeah, you got it. Now, that was supposed to be a trick question because a lot of people say Toronto, right? So it's not. It's Ottawa. Ottawa's the capital. Okay, that was the warm-up question. The others get a little bit harder. So, so now, if I were to say, um, if I were to say, uh, if, for, if a Canadian said he comes from Western Canada, which provinces are included in what a Canadian considers to be Western Canada? You, you can check the map if you like. The Western Canada, we consider these ones. British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. That's those four provinces of Western Canada. Okay. That's a prize. Next question. What does a Canadian consider the maritime provinces? Maritime provinces of Canada. This one's pretty hard too. Maritime provinces. Any guesses? What does maritime mean? Aha, what does maritime mean? Maritime means the ocean, correct? So it's got to be something that touches an, an ocean. We have three, <laughs> three oceans. <laughs> so which ones are the maritime provinces? I hope somebody can get the yes, please go take a try. Yes. 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 And yeah, and actually one more. That's close enough. Also, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, this here pit. So Newfoundland, Labrador, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and a little island here called Prince Edward Island. Those are the maritime provinces. Uh, what are the Canadian prairie provinces? Canadian prairie provinces. The plains, the prairies. Prairie, prairie provinces. What dun, is dun, dun. prairie? What is a prairie? That's a flat bit. If you know your United States geography, you just kind of go north of that part. Do we have an answer with a red shirt? I think you maybe looked this one up on Google. I'm not sure. <laughs> Canadian prairie provinces. Go ahead. Wrong. <laughs> okay. okay, that's wrong. Okay. Okay, here's another fellow right here. This one? Prairie Provinces of Canada. Alberta. Alberta, yes. Yeah. And Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah. And the final one is Manitoba. Manitoba. These three here are the Prairie Province. That's all that's all the Grand Plains. If you come south of there, you're into like you know, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. That's where the buffalo used to run up and down through there. Yes, that, all that area. Okay, what are, uh, what are the Canadian territories? Who can name the Canadian territories? Not provinces, territories. Different than a province. There we go. Here's the answer. He's got the answer here. Alberta and Saskatchewan. No, wrong. Those are, those are both provinces. <laughs> Ter the territories. Canada has three. Yukon? Yes. Yukon. Northwest. Northwest Territories. Yes. And? <laughs> 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 
Nunavut, close enough. Okay, there's, there's, this one's called Nunavut, Nunavut. That's where the Inuit people live in the Arctic. It goes right up to the North Pole, all the way up here where Santa Claus comes from up there. And uh, Northwest Territories in the Yukon. What's over here? What do you think's over here? Alaska, good. Okay, and uh, two more questions quickly. Central Canada, when Canadians say Central Canada, which two provinces do they mean? Central Canada. It's the industrial heartland where most of the people live. Industrial heartland. Central Canada? Is in Ontario. And? Quebec. Quebec, yeah. Ontario and Quebec. That's the industrial heartland of Canada. That's where uh, the vast majority of people live. And our capital city is right about there. Ottawa. Uh, Ottawa. Okay, and the final question. This is also a hard question, but it's the last one. In Canada, what do the three letters MTV, MTV, what does MTV stand for? Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's got something to do with cities. It's the three largest cities that we have in Canada. Uh, Toronto, yes. Vancouver, yeah. and Montreal. Montreal, M MTV. It's not the music television. Music television, MTV, no, it's Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, the three big cities in Canada. Thank you very much. So the, the winners get some prizes and we'll move along. Okay, so Canada is a big country. Uh, it's a fairly large country and we, uh, I guess what we're known for is being incredibly rich in natural resources. All sorts of, uh, all sorts of minerals, metals, forests, energy, agricultural products, for, uh, fisheries products. In fact, we have a surplus of natural resources, agricultural products, fisheries products, and therefore we have to export all those. We cannot consume that uh, domestically. We also have a very small population, 38 million people. So that's, I don't know, what is that like uh, 14, 14 million more than Taiwan maybe? 38 million people uh, in the second largest country in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore we have a fairly small internal, internal market and it's, it's a place that we need more population, therefore we encourage immigration. And uh, finally, it's actually reasonably well protected. We live in a good neighborhood in Canada. Uh, we only have one neighbor per se, that's the United States, who is a very close ally. And then we're protected on three sides by the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean. So it's, very, so it's a very secure neighborhood. Uh, we have a surplus of uh, minerals, energy, uh, food, so there's no food security issues. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's, a fairly, it's a fairly safe country, but we have a high motivation to attract immigration to our country, to populate it more, and we have a high dependency on the international system to export our goods. So Canadians are looking for a very stable, predictable international environment. Canada is also reasonably well connected. So, Canada has, uh, Canada has uh, free trade agreements uh, with two-thirds of the global economy. That means that people who produce goods, manufacture goods uh, in Canada, even if they're foreign companies, even Taiwanese companies in Canada, gain preferential market access to two-thirds of the global economy. And some of those uh, free trade, in fact, Canada is the only G7 country that has free trade agreements with every other G7 country. The United States does not, Japan does not, Great Britain does not. Only Canada has free trade agreements with all the G7 countries. Plus, of course, we have within North America free trade agreements with the United States, Mexico. We have free trade agreement with all of Europe, 27 countries in Europe. We have free trade agreement with the United Kingdom since they left the European Union. Uh, we, have the, we have free trade agreements with most of the Latin American and Caribbean countries. And, we have, and we're, we're uh, founding members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the comprehensive CPTPP. So that gives you Japan, Korea, uh, the Philippines. I, I, I'm not sure if they're listed there or not, but the, these countries here that you see in the bottom corner. So that's, a lot of the countries in uh, the Indo-Pacific region. So this is a great, and we're also, the other connection that Canada have is through the diversity of our population. You see that in Canada, there are over 200 
languages spoken in Canada, uh, because a great number of people, in fact, 22% of Canadians were born outside of Canada. You know, one in five Canadians was born somewhere else in the world. Uh, so we have all those people-to-people -people connections. If we take our largest city, Toronto, Toronto is Canada's largest city. 52% of the people in Toronto were born outside of Canada. So we have those people connections all over the world. So Canada is a reasonably connected uh, country, which is very important for us because we depend on the international system uh, for our economic uh, well-being. So how did Canada get started? Well, so this is the, uh, you know, an original map of Canada. It, it was essentially in the 17th century, in the 1600s, uh, the British and the French uh, began colonizing this part of the world. So it started with the French uh, mainly in this area down in here where you see Quebec today. They came in this river, the St. Lawrence River, and populated that area. The British pri primarily went in behind all the gray area although they didn't set up many cities or anything. So, uh, but, but following in, uh, in 1867, so 156 years ago today, uh, four, four colonies, they were British colonies at that time, uh, Upper Canada, Lower Canada, Quebec and Ontario, and these maritime provinces formed, that was, that was all of Canada right there. Uh, so that, that, uh, that, that's, a, that's 156 years ago, uh, today. But um, the kind of government that was set up uh, later as we evolve, our governance system, uh, is divided up, as I said earlier, it, it's a federal system. Canada is, uh, and, and Canada is also a constitutional monarchy, it's not a republic. So Canada's, uh, whereas in Taiwan, Taiwan's head of state is the president of the Republic of China, President Tsai. Uh, in Canada, the head of state is King Charles in London, England, okay? So Canada's head of state is the, is, is, is the king, but we have a representative, the Governor General in Canada. And the cons it's a federal system, so authority for uh, uh, different authorities are divided between provinces and territories and, and the federal government. Uh, the ones that are curious are things like uh, health, education, natural resources, the environment, all, those, all the authorities for those belong to the uh, provincial governments, the subnational government, not the national government. So you can imagine that when Canada negotiates uh, international treaties that deal with climate change or international trade or, or some kind of trade in uh, natural resources, uh, the, the federal government uh, must negotiate and have consultations with all of these governments to determine what our, uh, our international agreements are going to be. So that's a, a, an unusual feature of Canada's, um, uh, uh, Canada's uh, constitution. Moving along, uh, as I said at the outside, we're a very, uh, a very diverse, very multicultural country. So we have two, uh, two official languages in Canada, French, and English, uh, the French-speaking population is about 22% of the, the population of French-speaking. Uh, um, in, fact, in fact, the second largest French-speaking city in the world is Montreal after Paris. Paris is the largest French-speaking city. The second largest French-speaking city in the world is Montreal in the province of Quebec in Canada. Now, uh, except for uh, Aboriginal people, everyone else in Canada are immigrants, right? And there's uh, uh, two of the groups that are quite, uh, quite large these days are people who are, are from, uh, uh, are ethnically Chinese or ethnically Indian. So the uh, Chinese Canadian population is about 5% of Canada's population. That's 1.8 million people. Are, are, for, are ethnically Chinese. They may come from Malaysia, they may come from uh, the People's Republic of China, they may come from Taiwan, but they're ethnically Chinese, and that's about 5% of our population. And the same for the Indo-Canadian population, people who come from India, who've immigrated to Canada, that's about 1.8 million Canadians, 5% of our population. Again, 
20% of the population were born outside of Canada. Now the upshot of this, of course, is that um, uh, in, in Canada, you know, diversity is just the reality. Uh, our decision to include people uh, is a, a, inclusion is a choice that we make and we have multicultural policies in Canada to ensure the preservation, the respect and uh, the um, celebration of foreign heritages. Now this, uh, this mix also has an impact on the development of foreign policy because a lot of people in Canada have ties to somewhere else in the world and therefore they have very strong interest in international affairs uh, because of their, their family ties. So Canada, as I said, is, uh, is a, a country of immigration and we've had different waves of immigration. Um, so uh, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the early days, we had uh, uh, significant waves of, well, let's say from the 1600s uh, and the 1700s, it was mainly British and French. Beginning in the late 1800s, in the 1800s, we started advertising for people to come from Eastern Europe. So these were advertisements. This here is an advertisement for free land to come and be a farmer in Canada if you come from Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Eastern Europe. So we had large immigration from Eastern Europe and Russia uh, in the late 1800s. Uh, this is a Ukrainian family arriving in Quebec City, 1911. Uh, in fact, Canada now today, Ukraine is in the news quite a bit and Canada is very interested in Ukraine, not only for questions of sovereignty and territorial integrity and UN principles, peace and security, but also Canada has the third largest Ukrainian population in the world. The largest Ukrainian population is in Ukraine, second largest is in Russia and the third largest is in Canada. So Canada has a very close connections with, uh, with Ukraine. And then another, um, uh, another uh, we've had various waves of refugees who've come to Canada as well. So this picture is the airport in Toronto. All of these people are refugees from Syria who've come to Canada and our Prime Minister is right there. He's greeting them uh, on their arrival. We had 40,000 uh, 40, refugees came from Syria to Canada. Um, we've also had 40,000 refugees come from Afghanistan, most recently, to Canada. And we've had big waves of Ukrainian refugees coming to Canada as well more recently. Uh, Haiti is another country and Lebanon is another country where we've had refugees. But this goes back a while, back in 1975 when uh, uh, there were a large number of Vietnamese refugees who came to Canada at that time as well. So there have been different waves of uh, different waves of immigration. Most recently, the main source of immigration to Canada is from Asia. So uh, the other part of the Canadian population I want to speak about quickly are our Indigenous peoples. And you can see here that there are three major Indigenous groups. Uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit. So the Inuit people, uh, Inuit, they have their own writing system. It's up in the top corner there. Inuit. Uh, the translation of the, the name uh, Inuit means the people. So they call themselves the people, Inuit. And uh, we, see, uh, we see some traditional activities here. Of, of course, they're the people who occupied the Arctic region of Canada. So you see, uh, this is an iconic uh, thing from Canada. We call this an Inukshuk. And these are scattered around the, uh, the Arctic and they're used like signposts when people are traveling so they can see where they're going or for ceremonial purposes. You see someone building an igloo out of snow blocks here. And this is hunting for, hunting for seal underneath the Arctic, uh, Arctic Sea. So the sea is frozen and this man is hunting for seal uh, on that site there. Uh, the Métis people is, an, is another important indigenous group in Canada. Uh, these people are of uh, mixed race. So this would have been the French, the French or the English who settled in Canada and uh, they intermarried with the Aboriginal people and the term used is the Métis and uh, they mainly engaged in exploring the continent and in, uh, in a trapping of furs, collecting of furs that they would send, fur trapping that they would send back to, uh, to Canada. 
most uh, uh, in Canada, the way that uh, the country was sort of opened up and explored was by canoe, because uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of rivers and lakes in Canada, and if you come from uh, the St. Lawrence River, you go into the Great Lakes, the five Great Lakes that are on the border of Canada and the United States, and then the uh, the waterways continue right across the country, and that's how the Europeans traveled across the country by canoes, and along the way. Uh, they got married with a lot of indigenous women, and now we have a large uh, Métis population in Canada as well. And then the, the people who are not Métis and not uh, Inuit, we are referred to in Canada as the First Nations. And there are some 50 different nations or communities in Canada that have 50 different distinct languages and cultures. There's been a lot, uh, the indigenous people have left a, a quite a mark on Canadian history. A lot of place names and the names of things in Canada use, uh, use native language. So when we were reading out the names of provinces in Canada, one of them was Saskatchewan, which means fast moving water. Another one was Manitoba, which means a lake on the prairies. And there was another one, Quebec, that's Quebec City, a picture of Quebec City right there. That means where the water narrows, because the, Saint, the big St. Lawrence River that goes out to the Atlantic Ocean, it, there's one point where it gets very, very narrow. That's where Quebec is, and that's what the word means. It's the river gets narrow. And then we have other, you know, these are other sort of Canadian things. A kayak is, a, is the Inuit word for that boat, kayak. Uh, this is not Santa Claus's reindeer, this is a caribou. So that the caribou is a Canadian word as well, an indigenous word. And this animal, a very smelly animal, is a skunk. Uh, and those are all, all indigenous words that have been left by the, the people. Um, in, uh, indigenous art is also quite important in Canada. I've given you three, three examples here. This is an example of a piece of art from the Haida population. This is the creation of man, okay? So a raven, this large black bird, came down on the beach and found a clamshell, opened the clamshell and up from the shell crawled the people. So that's how people were created uh, by, the, uh, by this, this raven opening a clamshell. Uh, there are a lot of, a lot of um, uh, animals are used in indigenous art in Canada. And this is a contemporary painting of, uh, of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Catholic priests, and they are taking the children, indigenous children, First Nations children, away from their families to put them in residential schools to assimilate uh, the indigenous population. So this is a, a, a terrible part of Canadian history, and we are now in a very difficult process of reconciliation between uh, uh, the Canadian government, Canadian population, and the indigenous population over this kind of uh, activity that took place in Canada for a long period of time. I wanted to put, point these things out because uh, the point of, of this is that the Indigenous people in Canada are an important and they're the First Nations of Canada. And so when Canada uh, engages internationally, uh, we like to show that aspect of our culture. So there's cultural diplomacy, uh, but also uh, any uh, environmental uh, negotiation, international environmental negotiations we enter into, or negotiations regarding the Arctic in the north, uh, or anything related to human rights, uh, the Canadian government includes in its official delegations representatives of the Indigenous people of Canada so that they can speak on their own behalf, and it's not the government of Canada sort of representing them, but they represent their own. Uh, their own views and perspectives. So that's, uh, that's part of our reconciliation with Indigenous people, uh, kind of a unique bit of Canadian foreign policy. Uh, I'll carry on the piece uh, because we're going to talk about sort of the next stage in Canadian foreign policy, which is the launch of our Indo-Pacific strategy. But first, let's take a look at this here. So what are some of the big drivers in foreign policy? And typically, they are interests and values, right? And these are the things that can drive Canadian foreign policy as well. Interests are something that brings you advantages, right? And values are the principles that help you decide what is right and what is wrong 
and how to act in various uh, situations. So ca Canadian foreign policy is driven by both interests and values. As I've said earlier, Canada is a medium-sized country with only 38 million people. Uh, and we're highly dependent, uh, uh, well, we're a highly developed country, but we're highly dependent on the international system because we're an export-driven economy, just like Taiwan. Now, we're too small to impose our will on others. Uh, Canada cannot rely on uh, the use of force or, uh, or the use of uh, our market size uh, to, to do what we want. Uh, Canada, like ma many other mid-sized and smaller countries, needs to rely upon uh, persuasion, soft power, cooperation and negotiation rather than uh, harder uses of power. So for Canada, a key interest then uh, is an international system that is open, fair, transparent, rules-based and an international system where uh, where there are institutions that can, uh, can enforce or set the rules of the road. Uh, that's, that's in the Canadian interest uh, uh, to have that kind of a international environment and uh, that's why Canada uh, was actively involved in the establishment of the United Nations institutions and other multilateral organizations, notably the uh, uh, the global, uh, global Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which became the World Trade Organization. Economically, as I've mentioned many times, Canada is very interested in a rules-based international system for international trade. Of course, uh, Canada's attachment uh, to the rules-based international order is also based on Canadian values. So Canadian, the, 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 the fundamental values of Canadian society are uh, justice, uh, transparency, respect for others, equality, uh, those are the things that uh, have made Canadian society successful, have made Canadian institutions successful, uh, and then we like to see that reflected in international organizations and that's the way we approach our foreign policy as well. So that's, so we're, we're driven, like most other countries, by our interests and our values. So let's talk about the Indo-Pacific strategy, which I say was launched uh, in November of this past year. So this is the next, next and newest chapter in Canadian foreign policy. So why does Canada have a Indo-Pacific strategy? What is our motivation and interest here? Well, we recognize that, Canadians recognize that the Indo-Pacific region uh, will have a big impact on the future of Canada. Every issue that matters to Canadians, uh, whether it's national security, economic prosperity, democratic values, public health, environmental sustainability or human rights, all of these issues will be shaped by developments in the Indo-Pacific region and will be shaped by the relationships that Canada has with partners in the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, this region, as you can see from the slide, offers many opportunities, most of them economic in nature. The Indo-Pacific is the fastest growing economic region and has been responsible for two-thirds of global economic growth in re recent years. And of course, by 2030, uh, two-thirds of the global middle class will be living in this, in this the Indo-Pacific region. And by 2040, half of the global economy uh, will be here in the Indo-Pacific region. So those are very strong economic drivers. Of course, the Indo-Pacific region is Canada's uh, second largest market following the United States. It's also, it's also where uh, most of the important uh, supply chains for industries either originate or flow through the Indo-Pacific region. And actually Taiwan is at the nexus of this nervous system of, uh, of supply chains that span across the world. And there I'm thinking primarily about semiconductors, but a number of other elements too, uh, electronics and whatnot. So Taiwan is, is, is a big part of that. And also, as I've mentioned, uh, at least 
at least 50% or half of the new Canadians that immigrate to Canada will be coming from the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, Canadian targets for immigration have now been increased to 500,000 people a year. Half a million people a year we will bring in as new Canadians and half of those people will come from the Indo-Pacific region. So these are some of the, um, well I should also mention that 60% of Canada's international students also come from this region. So Canada has a lot of, lot of interests uh, in the region, but there are challenges too. The Indo-Pacific region offers a lot of challenges. Uh, some of those uh, 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 we speak about quite a bit here in Taiwan, one of them being rising authoritarianism, authoritarianism in the Indo-Pacific region that threatens democratic governance and human rights. And here I'm thinking primarily of, uh, uh, of, of China, North Korea, Myanmar. Uh, China is actively seeking to reinterpret the rules-based international order to gain greater advantage for itself, attempting to shape the international order into a more permissive environment for China's interests and values that are increasingly different than ours. And we saw the uh, meetings between President uh, Xi Jinping and President Putin in Moscow just recently where they're speaking about their new vision for uh, an international system or an international order that will have little or no respect for democratic governance and universal human rights. Uh, but quite a bit of influence on great power. Also in the region there are flash, flash points of potential conflict across the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, on the Korean Peninsula. These are all flashpoints for potential conflict. And of course climate change uh, is an existential threat for everyone. Uh, and uh, currently, the Indo-Pacific countries uh, have some of the highest, highest greenhouse gas emissions in the world, counting for some 50% of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So from a, a question of addressing climate change, biodiversity loss, and uh, marine plastics, plastics that go into the ocean or protection of the ocean, uh, this region is incredibly important. So, moving along quickly, uh, what, then, what, what, what then makes up the, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, Indo strategy for Canada? Well, this is a, it's a 10-year strategy uh, that will bring a generational change to Canadian foreign policy and Canada as a whole. It provides Canada with a comprehensive roadmap uh, to deepen our engagement in the Indo-Pacific region over the next de decade. And there are five pillars uh, to the strategy, as you can see here, that address peace and stability, economic growth and prosperity, people-to-people -people ties, and sustainable development. And the overriding objective is for Canada to contribute to a secure, prosperous, and sustainable Indo-Pacific region, which in turn will contribute to Canada's prosperity, security, and well-being. But of course this will require substantial financial and human resource investments from Canada over the next 10 years as we attempt to increase Canada's uh, diplomatic presence in the region, increase Canada's defense presence in the region, increase Canada's international development assistance presence in the region, and increase the presence of Canadian companies in the region as well. Uh, we'll also need a lot of work back in Canada to ensure that uh, Canadian stakeholders, be they the government, business, academics, civil society organizations, the media, have the competencies and the capability to engage effectively with the Indo-Pacific region. So there's some learning uh, to do there as well. So uh, let me go through each of those five pillars quickly. Uh, the first one, and I'll make some specific comments about how Canada will work with Taiwan on, under each of these pillars. So, so the first one then, of course Canada and Taiwan have shared concerns and interests in peace and security in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, Canada is particularly concerned about China's increasingly coercive behavior in the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, and the East China Sea. 
as well as domestic interference in, in the forms of disinformation, cyber, cyber attacks, and other economic and political coercion. So Canada aims to strengthen its partnerships in the region, including with Taiwan, uh, to address security concerns and maintain peace and security. This will include increased Canadian Armed Forces participation in regional defence exercises with allies and partners in the region. There will be increased Canadian Armed Forces uh, contributions to multilateral missions such as the uh, UN mission that's enforcing sanctions on North Korea for its nuclear weapons program. And the result of that will be that there will be a more frequent deployment of Canadian Navy ships transiting through the Taiwan Strait and there'll be, uh, there'll be more uh, Canadian uh, Air Force, Canadian uh, military Air Force uh, surveillance aircraft flying in the East China Sea's regions. And bilaterally with Taiwan, we look to have increased sharing of information and analysis about the security threats in the region and also closer cooperation on issues like cybersecurity, countering disinformation, uh, those sorts of things as well. The Indo-Pacific strategy clearly states in the document that uh, Canada will push back against any unilateral action to change the status quo in the Taiwan, in the, in the Taiwan Straits. So that's a commitment uh, from Canada's part. Let me take a look at the next one. The next pillar was uh, dealing with um, uh, economic, economic issues, trade issues. Well, uh, fortunately, the complementarity between Taiwan's economy and the Canadian economy uh, uh, gives us some natural uh, benefits of cooperating in trade, investment, and in science and technology and innovation cooperation. There are benefits to be gained uh, from our, our cooperation due to the complementary natures of our economies. And we both, Taiwan and Canada, have a strong interest in transitioning our economies towards a green digital future. So that transition will require a lot of cooperation in the areas of science, technology, innovation and of course trade. Uh, we also have a strong interest in strengthening the resilience of supply chains uh, and reducing our vulnerabilities and dependencies on authoritarian, authoritarian governments where we have very strong trade relations also. So some of the things that we'll do between Canada and Taiwan in keeping with our Indo-Pacific strategy would be on the international trade policy front, we'll build some of that architecture between our two uh, uh, jurisdictions that will facilitate trade. So right now we are negotiating, Canada and Taiwan are negotiating a foreign investment promotion and protection arrangement and then other arrangements that we'll put in place to facilitate trade will be uh, arrangements and agreements for cooperation in science, technology, innovation and also in health. So those are all areas where there'll be business opportunities, there'll be research opportunities. We also have a, a strong interest in achieving clean energy, clean, uh, clean manufacturing technologies and those are all areas where we will cooperate going forward. Uh, Taiwan has just increased its presence in Canada by opening a trade and economic and cultural affairs office in Montreal, Canada and we're expanding here as well. So the next one we'll look at is... Um, people. So this one, this one is, uh, is connecting people. Okay, so Canada, Canada and Taiwan also enjoy uh, very close people-to-people -people ties. We have 50,000 Canadian citizens living in Taiwan and there are uh, at least 150,000 people of Taiwan origin uh, living in Canada. So right there we've got a, a reasonably good base to get started on but most importantly we share common democratic values and principles of individual freedom, rule of law, respect for human rights and diversity. That's what we have in common. And we want to, Canada wants to further strengthen that bond between Taiwanese and Canadian people through uh, cultural exchanges, educational exchanges, joint ac academic research, parliamentary exchanges 
and of course exchanges related to indigenous affairs, given that Taiwan too has a very large indigenous aboriginal population. Uh, some of the things we have underway right now, uh, beginning last year we've launched on the cultural sphere, uh, uh, we've launched in Taiwan something called the Festival of Canadian uh, Arts and Culture in Taiwan uh, and from now until the end of 2024 there will be uh, visual arts, performing arts, film, literature and other cultural activities that we're carrying out in Taiwan to, to, to share Canadian culture with people here and we're hoping that Taiwan too will reciprocate uh, with Canada. Uh, in the education area, of course, there are dual diploma programs. I believe uh, your university has relationships uh, with Canadian universities for dual di diploma programs. And uh, of course, as, as Taiwan moves towards a bilingual 2030 agenda, uh, Canada too will, will play its role to assist in that regard. We also, of course, have a shared interest and concern about, as I said earlier, about climate change biodiversity loss, and ocean protection. And here, uh, as I've said, both Canada and Taiwan are transitioning towards a green, low-carbon economy. And we both have committed to net zero emissions by 2050. So this requires partnership and cooperation. Examples of what we're doing is Taiwan has a major uh, renewable energy project underway in the Taiwan Straits and that's the building out of offshore wind, offshore wind power. So Canada's largest investment in Taiwan is in the development of offshore wind. One of the, the biggest Canadian companies in Taiwan is, is not Lululemon or, or Canada Goose or Roots, uh, but a company called uh, Northland Power. And uh, Northland Power, uh, Northland Power uh, has a project to develop offshore wind in, the, um, um, uh, in one major block and is expanding out in, uh, in the Taiwan Straits as well. But there are a lot of opportunities, whether it's bioenergy, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, clean manufacturing technology, uh, the use of liquefied natural gas, LNG, as a transition fuel to lower emissions. All of these things we're doing. I'll mention one more where we want to cooperate closely with Taiwan and that's in the area of uh, critical minerals. These are all the minerals that are needed for the technologies for a tra tra transition to a green, clean, digital economy in the future. That includes semiconductors, that includes uh, batteries for electric vehicles and a lot of other technology uh, that will help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and, ha and have a greener economy going forward. These critical minerals now, all of us, Taiwan, Canada and most countries in the world, are highly dependent upon China and Russia for those minerals. It just so happens that in Canada, Canada is the only democratic country in the world that has all of the critical minerals for batteries for electric vehicles, for semiconductor production and for all those uh, clean tech, tech technologies that we need for the future. So we want to partner with Taiwan in the full supply chain of critical minerals from mining and processing to manufacturing and recycling of critical minerals. The point being for us to be able to reduce our vulnerabilities and dependencies on authoritarian governments for these critical minerals that will have a big impact on our prosperity in the future. So we can help each other to reduce our dependency and vulnerability on authoritarian states as we transition to a green digital future. The last slide I want to show you today then is the, the, last, uh, the last part of our Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, in inclusion I would like to say that essentially the Indo-Pacific strategy, Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, provides the foreign policy framework and the strategic direction for how Canada wants to deepen and strengthen its presence in the Indo-Pacific region and how we want to advance our bilateral relationships here including with Taiwan. The Indo-Pacific strategy provides a, a roadmap 
for the development of our Canada-Taiwan partnership for the next decade, for the next 10 years. And Canada is stepping up its multifaceted engagement with Taiwan, collaborating on trade, technology, health, the environment, democratic governance, countering disinformation, strengthening our people-to-people -people ties, and supporting regional peace and security. And the foundation, as I've said, of the Canada-Taiwan relationship is our shared values and principles. That's individual freedom, the rule of law, respect for human rights, and diversity. And Canada and Taiwan also have a shared interest in reducing our economic vulnerabilities and dependencies in an increasingly turbulent world rocked by geopolitics. And we're doing this as we transition to a green digital future. And finally, Canada and Taiwan have shared concerns and interests in maintaining peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. And under our new Indo-Pacific strategy, Canada is committed to supporting a more secure, prosperous and sustainable Indo-Pacific region. Thank you very much for your attention. We can have some questions if you like.